man, and then they, they get on TV and even in the music, man, and they do a bad job with like Al Poe and Ray Foy and all them. So what is American gangster about them? Them American rap. Ray Foy and Al Poe and Nicky Balls and Sammy Bull, man, them rap. Henry Hill, the people of the state of New York versus Henry Hill, docket number 704162. Uh, yes, sir, that's me. Oh, Councillor Percy. Congratulations. Here's your graduation present. From what for? I pinched. Everybody gets pinched, but you did it right. You told them nothing, and they got nothing. I thought you'd be mad. Man, I'm not mad. I'm proud of you. You took your first pinch like a man, and you learned the two greatest things in life. What? Look at me. You never ride on your friends, and always keep your mouth shut. At the age of 12, my ambition was to be a gangster. To me, being a wise guy was better than being president of the United States. To be a wise guy was to own the world. This is Henry Hill. Henry spent half his life running with one of the most violent mafia gangs in America, having to do whatever was asked of him to survive. His life in the mob was made infamous by Martin Scorsese's gangster classic, Goodfellas. Goodfellas is widely regarded as the most unflinching portrayal of life in the Mafia ever made. And this scene of a brutal mob slaying actually happened in front of Henry Hill. What Henry witnessed will haunt him for the rest of his life. He used to turn my fucking stomach, you know. And I, I, I mean, I lived in fear every fucking day of my life. But Henry's real life in the mob was far more vicious than Goodfellas could ever portray. It's extraordinary. I don't know what kind of a person it makes you become. I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? And where the movie ends, the darkest part of Henry's life began. That's when life really became insane. In a bid to save his own life, Henry became a government informant and betrayed his childhood friends. The Mafia issued a multi-million dollar contract on his life. They were not going to take this lying down. They were going to look for Henry, and they were going to look to have him executed. It's not a way to live. I mean, he might as well be dead. This is the whole story of Henry Hill, told by the few that survived. Why I'm still here, why I'm around, Heck, I don't know, I got those guardian angels on my shoulder, some, you know, for some reason. There were elements uh, in his family life that were problems with his father, and I think uh, to a certain extent he looked for his father to other men, men who behaved differently. When a cab stand run by Paul Vario, a high-ranking member of a mob family, opened across the street, Henry was transfixed. <laughs> Across the street from my house, you know, with the fucking Cadillacs and diamond rings and the fucking wads of hundred dollar bills and bimbos on each arm and you know, I mean, it was it was intoxicating. For whatever reason, I guess because of Henry's charm, they uh, they took a shine towards him. And they patted me on a fucking back and gave me fucking fives and tens. And that day, you know, you know, in the fifties, that was a lot of fucking money. He became a member of the crew just as the movie shows when he was when he was a young kid. At 13, I was making more money than most of the grown-ups in the neighborhood. I mean, I had more money than I could spend. I had it all. One day, one day some of the kids from the neighborhood carried my mother's groceries all the way home. You know why? It was out of respect. Behind him, an inferno erupts, uh, as if he's in hell, basically, because that's where he's going, ultimately. When he first started earning money and he would try to give gifts to my mother and my father, they would never be accepted, not one dollar. So he would try to demean, well, I make more in a week than you make all year, you know, during a holdup or robbery or whatever. These things broke my parents' heart. I thought it was a fucking game, you know. Here, take this fucking pistol, shoot, shoot a fucking window a couple of times, you know? I mean, it was exciting, you know, it was, it was intoxicating. 
Henry didn't realize he was becoming involved in one of the New York Mafia's most violent crews run by Paul Vario, a capo or captain in the Lucchese crime family. He treated me better than he treated his own sons. I mean, I love the guy, you know what I mean? I, you know, I did. Paul Vario was probably one of the most frightening people I've ever been around. He had an aura of menace about him that was quite remarkable, but the Paul Servino characterization didn't pick it up at all. In Goodfellas, Paul Vario was played by Paul Sorvino. The portrayal was of a brooding fatherly figure. In reality, Vario was capable of acts of brutal violence. It was on these streets that Vario would reveal his true nature to an impressionable Henry Hill. I must have been 13, 12, 13 years old and took the fucking baseball bat out of the back of the fucking car, walks in the fucking bar, and I could see it, you know, from where I was, and he starts hitting the fucking bar mate with his fucking baseball bat. I mean, beating the shit out of this fucking woman, you know, broke a fucking collarbone. She she ratted on him that he was going out with it, you know, to his fucking wife or some bullshit. You know, it was just you know, stupid shit like that. But I mean fucking holy fuck, because you know, I, I never seen that part of him, you know, at that you know, at that point. You know, and then I start to realize, you know, these fucking guys are fucking gangsters. Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh but, you know, I kind of knew when I, you know, I didn't want to know. I knew when I didn't want to know, you know what I mean? I didn't want to see it. Sometimes I had to see it, you know. Once I crossed that line as a kid, I didn't want to go back. I was spoiled. I was greedy. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think back sometimes, you know, why, you know, why, why did I stay? Through Paul Vario, Henry would befriend Jimmy Burke, a gangster far more unstable and psychotic than Goodfellas could ever show. The film actually kind of softened him up. I wouldn't want to see what he was capable of. <laughs> you put it that way. Together, they would pull off an audacious heist that would finally earn Henry the underworld respect he craved. It's my fucking, it's, it's my payday, you know? This is Henry Hill. His early life in the Mafia was the basis for Martin Scorsese's gangster classic, Goodfellas. You know, it's very hard for people in that world to make a straight living. It's very hard for them to do it. Um, and it's like, it's like an addiction. Craving money and power, a teenage Henry Hill had chosen to run with one of the most violent mafia gangs in New York, run by Paul Vario, a capo in the Lucchese crime family. It's a very evil environment where people are concerned about what their next score is going to be and whether they're going to get killed. Through Vario, Hill would meet two of the most psychotic gangsters in New York, far more brutal than the movie could ever portray. Tommy was just a fucking loose horse, a fucking homicidal fucking maniac. While showing Henry the path to underworld respect, they would entrench him in a violent life that he would never escape. Every fucking day I was asked to do a little bit more than I did yesterday, you know what I mean? And uh, they were just sucking me in, you know? Not, you know, but... I mean, you know, I, I just didn't know the word no, you know what I mean? Whatever I was asked to do, I did. Sensing his inevitable fate, Hill made his first of two ultimately doomed attempts to escape the clutches of the Mafia. I figured, fuck it, you know, let me join the army, maybe these fucking people will leave me the fuck alone, you know what I mean? On June the 11th, 1960, Henry Hill joined the U.S. paratroopers stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 500 miles away from Vario's crew. It was sort of a feeble attempt that he would make periodically throughout his life to distance himself from this, this gangster way of life. I don't know, maybe I was bored with that fucking shit, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I was ready to move on in my life and didn't know how. However, Henry's life of crime was already far too ingrained. It's very hard for people in that world to live what you would say a, a more straight existence. I got in a lot of trouble, you know, I, mean, I had a couple court marshals. Uh, you know, drinking and just fucking carrying on, fighting the Marines. He started to resume some of his criminal activities that he learned in Brooklyn, such as gambling, shylocking. He was lending people money. After spending two months in a military stockade for fighting and stealing a sheriff's car, Private Hill was discharged from the U.S. Army. When he had a bed run with the army, he went back to the welcoming arms of the Vario crew, and he found a home there. It was right there, you know, and they, they all was glad to see me come home, and, you know, then it was, then it was a lot different, you know what I mean? Then it was, 
It was, it was the real fucking deal. Henry's return to Mafia life was sealed when he met Jimmy Burke, played by Robert De Niro in Goodfellas. However, De Niro didn't portray the true brutality of the real Jimmy Burke. He was a maniac. He was a fucking maniac. And people knew that they couldn't cross that fucking line with him. You crossed that fucking line with him, you were dead. And you didn't get a second chance. You know, he'd, he'd just you to fucking death, you know, take you to dinner and then fucking kill you, you know, for dessert. I mean, that's, that was Jimmy. With his fearsome reputation, Burke was Hill's ticket to money and underworld respect. And he'd walk in the door and everybody who worked the room just went wild. He'd give the doorman a hundred just for opening the door. He'd shove hundreds in the pockets of the dealers and all the guys that ran the games. I mean, the bartender got a hundred just for keeping the ice cubes cold. See, Jimmy was one of the most feared guys in the city. I mean, he was first locked up at 11 and he was doing hits for mob bosses when he was 16. Somebody like Jimmy the Gent was a terrific mentor. He would teach you how to pull burglaries, robberies, big holdups, how to deal in cocaine, how to deal in heroin. He knew the ropes. No matter what it was, I mean, if it was fucking dealing in stocks and bonds or fucking uh, uh, or hijacking a truck or fucking whacking somebody, you know what I mean? Jimmy, he had the answer. He can go anywhere. It's like a magic carpet. You just go anywhere he wants. You know, you can fly through the world. Henry showcased his newfound wealth at the notorious mob hangout, the Copacabana. To be able to go to the Copacabana, this was a major, uh, major height of, I think, sophistication sit down at the fucking table in the cope and Sammy Davis come over and sit down have drinks with you. Sinatra, come over to the fucking table with Paulie was there, you know? I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was fucking wild. It was chaotic. Henry was riding high. But when he met Karen, played by Lorraine Bracco in Goodfellas, he was forced to question his mobster lifestyle. She didn't know what I did in the beginning. You know, she knew that, you know, I kind of, you know, I thought I was a, a, a union delegate, you know. And she was apart from that world that I was in with. Henry and Karen married and moved to this leafy suburb in Long Island. Now Henry made his final attempt to escape the clutches of the Vario crew. It was another way of trying to fucking, you know, insulate myself from those fucking lunatics that, you know, that, that I was partners with and, you know, hung, hung with, uh, you know. And... Desperate to become legitimate, Henry bought The Suite, a supper club in Queens, New York. It looked for a moment like he might actually become a restaurateur and a bar owner. That lasted just a matter of months. He, he just couldn't, he, he was drawn back in. He just fucking followed me, you know. And the place, you know, the place thrived and became a fucking headquarters. Within months, the suite was a mob hangout full of the people Henry had tried to escape. One of the regulars was Tommy Di Simeone, played by Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. Tommy was just a fucking loose horse fucking homicidal fucking maniac, you know. The film actually fucking, you know, uh, kind of softened him up. It gave him enjoyment to break somebody's wrists, uh, murder somebody, beat him up with a bat. Yeah, he, he was actually a psycho, and then, he, you know, he, he was fucking strung out on coke constantly. How the fuck am I funny? What the fuck is so funny about me? Tell me, tell me what's funny. Get the fuck out of here, to Tommy. <laughs> you motherfucker! I almost had him. I almost had him. Stuttering, yeah, stuttering prick yet? Frankie, was he shaking? I wonder about you sometimes, Henry. You may fold under. Question. Tommy would end Henry's attempt to go legit by committing a savage murder inside his club. One night, it was really late, and a, a guy by the name of Billy Bats was in there. He was a made organized crime figure, very important kind of guy. Jimmy and Tommy just fucking beat his fucking head in. We had, you know, there was an area we had a slave floor, you know, and Tommy beat him so fucking hard that the pistol fell apart. You understand? Yeah. In Goodfellas, the hit was over a petty argument, but in reality, this vicious murder was over an ongoing turf war. There was a beast story there that never was shown in Goodfellas. Billy Bats had just come home from prison. He had all the Sherlock business there, the bookmaking business. And Jimmy, you know, when he was away, Jimmy took it all over, basically. 
and Jimmy knew he had to kill him eventually. They cross a line that, unfortunately, is just no coming back, and somebody's going to have to pay for it. Billy Batts was a made man, a fully initiated member of the Mafia. The penalty for killing a made man was death. To ensure the body was never found, they threw Bats into the trunk of Hill's car and drove to Pennsylvania to dig his grave. On the journey, Hill made a chilling discovery. Bats wasn't dead. It was sickening. It was fucking sickening. It was actually sickening, you know? You know, then we opened the fucking trunk and, he, you know, he looked at me and he says, Henry, you know? That ended Henry's ever being able to walk away. It was over. I mean, the suite was gone. Uh, he was now the participant in a homicide. And uh, his bond now was to those with whom he had done the homicide. I was always there to do what I had to do. But yet, you know, he used to turn my fucking stomach, you know. And I, I, I mean, I lived in fear every fucking day of my life. You know, I, 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 I did, you know. I mean, I, I, I was no... <laughs> You know, I, I didn't like the violence involved, you know, but, you know, I, if I showed any sign of weakness, I know I'd get fucking killed. Henry's dreams of escaping were over. He was back working in Vario's crew, having to do whatever was asked of him to survive. In 1972, a seemingly innocuous trip to Florida would result in his first incarceration. Ultimately, they just do one thing too many, and they think they're going to get away with it, and they're not. He and Jimmy uh, went down to Florida to pick up some money that was owed. There was somebody had had uh, owed a lot of money to some organized crime guys. And we snatched him out of the fucking bar and uh, beat the fuck out of him, you know, smacked the shit out of him, pistol whipped him. My recollection is that we later found out the facts of that case and that they had chained somebody behind a car and dragged them for <laughs> a good a good space. And uh, But to Henry, that was just smacking somebody around a little bit. He paid the fucking money the next day. But his sister worked for the FBI. We didn't know that. On November the 3rd, 1972, following a successful FBI investigation, Henry and Jimmy Burke each received 10 years in federal prison on charges of interstate gambling and assault. Fuck it, you know, no big fucking deal, you know. 10 years, I'll do six years, you know. I'll still be a young guy when I got out, sure enough. You know, and then fucking prison was a fucking joke. You know, it, when you think of prison, you get pictures okay. in your mind of all those old movies with rows and rows of guys behind bars. But it wasn't like that for wise guys. It really wasn't that bad, except that I missed Jimmy. He was doing his time in Atlanta. Benny, give me two steaks while you're in there, all right, John? Sure enough, she goes in up. I mean, everybody else in the joint was doing real time, all mixed together, living like pigs. But we lived alone. We give the impression of it being breezier than it was. To add to the irony of it, with the music that's playing and that sort of thing and getting lobsters. But this was what we, we had guards who told us this is the reality too. I mean, it was all there. It's all there. I mean, there's certain people who were privileged. Hill's privileges were paid for by bribing the guards and that meant earning on the inside. Hill turned to fellow inmate Paul Mazzi who showed him how much money could be made dealing narcotics. They used to joke to us, you fucking stupid fucks, you fucking around with trailer trucks, we'll fucking give you two shoeboxes full of fucking heroin, and it's ten times as much money as you make off ten fucking trailers. You know, it's not a pretty fucking good idea. That starts to eat away, and money always corrupts. Um, corrupts the corrupted. It was a turning point for Henry. By selling narcotics, Hill was breaking a sacred mafia edict that was punishable by death. The reason that they have the edict is not because they have any moral compunctions about the use of narcotics or selling narcotics. It's because the experience going back to the 50s and 60s is that drug dealers turn on the higher-ups, and, and the higher-ups in the, in the organized crime families wanted to ensure they wouldn't be the, uh, the victims of their underlings who got caught selling drugs. It was, uh, it was too easy, you know what I mean? Henry was now concealing his part in Billy Bat's death and his drug dealing from his mob bosses, and he was getting hooked on the drugs he was secretly selling. The high life was slipping away. I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? 
Mere months after his release from prison, Hill would become involved in the biggest cash robbery ever committed on American soil. That's when life really became insane. What should have been his defining moment would mutate into an orgy of violence, murder, and ultimately, betrayal. I was a dead man walking, and I knew it. By the time Henry Hill was released from prison, his life in the Mafia was spiraling out of control. That's when life really became insane. He had been involved in the execution of initiated Mafia member Billy Batts and had started dealing drugs. He knew when the Mafia finally found out, he was a dead man. They were gonna kill me. Or we'll kill my wife, or we'll kill my kids. And in 1978, Hill and Mafia mentor Jimmy Burke pulled off the notorious Lufthansa heist, a robbery that spawned a vicious killing spree and ultimately led to Henry Hill's cold-hearted betrayal of the mob. You didn't get me, motherfucker. No, I got you. On Sunday the 11th of December 1978, Jimmy Burke's crew, acting on a tip-off from Henry Hill, pulled off the largest cash robbery ever committed on American soil. Five heavily armed and masked men the day fled with an estimated $3 million in cash and $300,000 in jewelry from the Lufthansa Airlines cargo hangar at New York's Kennedy Airport. The robbery was front page news across America. The actual figure stolen would rise to $5 million in cash and a $1 million in jewels. The news of the robbery was not only on the radio, but it was television. Of course, the tabloids uh, splashed it across the front page, and uh, it, was, it was huge news. Everybody in the fucking city knew it was us. The whole fucking... I mean, there wasn't a wise guy that didn't know that we didn't do it. You know what I mean? And the fucking feds knew it, too. Within a day or two, uh, law enforcement knew for sure, based on what their informants were telling him, that it was Jimmy Burke's crew that had carried out the robbery. The FBI's first breakthrough was the discovery of the van used in the robbery, driven by Stax Edwards. Stax was always crazy. Instead of getting rid of the truck like he was supposed to, he got stoned, went to his girlfriend's, and by the time he woke up, the cops had found the truck. He was supposed to get rid of the fucking van. They found his fucking fingerprints on it. Before the FBI could interrogate Stax, Burke had him executed. The killing spree had begun. It was very hard to develop evidence in the Lufthansa case because people who were involved started turning up dead. The FBI put the entire Vario crew under surveillance. It wasn't long before they started giving themselves away by showing off their newfound wealth. Stupid, I mean, guys with fucking IQs of, uh, you know, 26 are fucking going and buy fucking new Cadillacs, fucking $40,000 mink coats and shit. And little by little, the men who showed off that they had the money were killed. He just tried to eliminate everybody. And he had to, because people were going fucking nuts. Fucking three-month period, 12 fucking guys, and one wife, they found torso off. Out of the fucking, rolled up on a fucking beach in Rockaway. One of them wound up getting killed and hung up in an ice truck, and he was frozen stiff. It took three days from the body to thaw so they could give it an autopsy. I can remember one in particular who we brought into the strike force told him that the FBI had informant information that he was going to be killed. And he listened politely and uh, looked at both of us and said, can I go? And he did, and he walked out, and his body parts washed up several weeks later. Within months, Jimmy Burke, with Paul Vario's blessing, had slaughtered everyone involved in the heist. Henry Hill was the last man standing. I seen the handwriting on a fucking wall. You know, I didn't have no way out. You know, I mean, I was fucked. I was literally fucked, you know what I mean? Henry knew Jimmy wanted him dead. He had to find a way out. You know, from, you know, from having fucking life, you know, on Easy Street, you know, with open, you know, three or four restaurants, like, I got a fucking million dollars cash, you know, I ain't had to launder it. You know, open a few restaurants. Now I'm in the fucking heroin business. Throughout the Lufthansa killing spree, Henry had become heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. 
He knew that his Mafia boss, Paul Vario, would order his death if he ever got caught. We knew he was uh, involved in uh, the sale and distribution of heroin, cocaine, quaaludes, any number of different illegal drugs. Hill's drug dealing had attracted the attention of the Nassau County Police Department, who placed him under surveillance. With Vario, Burke, the FBI, and the police closing in, amazingly, he would find a way to make his problems even worse. Very quickly, he began to snort heroin, uh, became addicted to heroin, became addicted to cocaine, and um, uh, his judgment was pretty cloudy in those days. He wound up putting a lot of drugs out on the street and didn't get paid for it. Couldn't remember who, half the time, who we gave what to. I got so fucking wacky on drugs. I mean, not wacky. I mean, I was able to function, but I was, you know, strung out on, you fucking name it, I was strung out on it. The anxiety and the pressure that he's feeling, I think are really so evident, uh, the way Scorsese shot the scene. And then I had to pick up some new Pittsburgh stuff for Lois to fly down to some customers I had near Atlanta. The FBI and testifying in a dozen mob trials, Henry Hill used to say that if he lived long enough on the land, he would write, somebody write a cookbook. The FBI agents, marshals, and prosecutors all laughed. I laughed too. He fooled us all. <laughs> <laughs> I can I curse? Yeah, sure. I'm trying to keep it simple. Italian cooking is not difficult. No. You know? When you said, I'm going to cook, what do all the wise guys say when you're like, I'm going to do this? Yeah, yeah, f***ing Irish, but you're going to cook. <laughs> now, did you cut the garlic with a razor blade, or how'd you cut this time? Nah, I used a knife. <laughs> Paulie did the prep work. He was doing a year for contempt, and he had this wonderful system for doing the garlic. He used a razor, and he used to slice it so thin that it used to liquefy in the pan with just a little oil. It's a very good system. Prison was never hard for wise guys. They had their own wing, their own pots and pans and stoves. Fresh supply of produce, lobster, veal, steak, and wine. That's good. Every night. This is a funny one. This is Henry the Rat <laughs> looking at from Brooklyn to Manhattan. When did you drop me that? <laughs> I, know, I yeah. did quite a few of them. Uh, this is one of my favorites. What's on side? <laughs> What's this one? Oh, here? Bell, Barry and Billy Bats. That's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take a moment, look at that picture. Go. That's that's a guy that's that's dead dead now. You ever regret turning everybody in? Uh, in the beginning I did. You know, in the beginning, I did. they told me all I had to do was testify in the one one case, and mm -hmm. that's all they were interested in, tons of robbery. But it was opening a can of worms. That was the lowest thing in the world to be as a rat, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, when you come after your family, you, you know, everything holy to you. Yep. You got to do it. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You see that out of, you know, die. First of all, it took me like 10 years to forgive myself for what I did. Yeah. You know, for being a rat. How did you come to terms with that, forgiving yourself? How does one go through that process? You know, I went to psychiatrists. I sit with them for, you know, 15 minutes. I said, you know what? Stop. You don't got to pay me $400 an hour. Get the so f out of here. Did you miss it? And I know that's a Hell weird question. no. Not at all. No. I feel so grateful that I was able to get out of it alive because mm -hmm. I come really close. To, you know, I mean, after the little thunder of robbery. Yeah. You know, it that was, was a big deal. Yeah, it was. It was still a Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Do you have moments where you just think about those days? You know, I, I, I try not to. I, I, you know, I, if, if I see it on TV, I see something run on TV, I watch The Sopranos or one of them stupid shows. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that I was part of that at one time. Honest to God. It feels like a lifetime ago. <sighs> it does. You know, I mean, because I, I don't live that way today. Take care, my friend. Help yourself. Okay. You, want, you, you right? want me to serve you too? No, you don't. <laughs> I've met. Henry a bunch of times after the movie uh, was made because uh, Martin Scorsese, the director, he didn't want me to, to talk to him before. And uh, you'd never look at him and think tough guy. Hello, Henry. You ready? Yeah. Come on. Oh, no, wait a minute. What? Quick, you have to cover that cross. My mother sees that cross. Karen? Mom, I'd like you to meet my friend Henry Hill. How do you do? Hi, nice to meet you. My daughter says that uh, you're half Jewish. Um, just the good half. <laughs> One of our favorite movies here at CBS This Morning, Goodfellas, tells the story of Henry Hill, the real-life gangster who turned against the mob. Well, we just learned he died yesterday in Los Angeles. Henry Hill was 69.